The Dead Hand was written in 1856. This BBC Radio production is read by Peter Marinka and was first broadcast in 1989. When this present 19th century was younger by a good many years than it is now, a certain friend of mine named Arthur Holliday happened to arrive in the town of Doncaster exactly in the middle of the race week. He was one of those reckless, rattle-pated, open-hearted young gentlemen who scramble carelessly along the journey of life, making friends wherever they go. His father was a rich manufacturer, and had bought landed property enough in one of the Midland counties to make all the born squires in his neighbourhood thoroughly envious of him. A report or scandal said that the old gentleman had been rather wild in his youthful days, and that, unlike most parents, he was not disposed to be violently indignant when he found that his only son took after him. Well, one September, as I told you, young Arthur comes to Doncaster, he did not reach the town till towards the close of evening, and he went at once to see about his dinner and bed at the principal hotel. Dinner they were ready enough to give him, but as for a bed, they laughed when he mentioned it. All the bright golden sovereigns in his pocket would not buy him a bed at Doncaster in the race week. He went on applying at every place of entertainment for travellers that he could find, until he wandered into the outskirts of the town. Down the winding road before him shone the dull gleam of an oil lamp, the one faint, lonely light that struggled ineffectually with the foggy darkness all around him. As he got near the lamp he heard voices, and found that it lighted the entrance to a narrow court, on the wall of which was painted a long hand in faded flesh colour, pointing with a lean forefinger to this inscription, The Two Robins. On entering the passage, he was passed by a stranger with a knapsack in his hand, who was evidently leaving the house. "'Oh, no, Mr. Landlord,' said the traveller, addressing himself to a fat, sly-looking, bald-headed man with a dirty white apron. "'I am not easily scared by trifles, but I don't mind confessing that I can't quite stand that.' "'If you've got a bed to let, Landlord,' said Holliday, "'and if that gentleman won't pay your price for it, I will.' The sly landlord looked hard at Arthur. "'Are you game for five shillings?' he inquired. Arthur nearly laughed in the man's face, but, thinking it prudent to control himself, offered the five shillings as seriously as he could. The landlord held out his hand, then suddenly drew it back again. "'You're acting all fair and above board by me,' he said, "'and before I take your money I'll do the same by you. Look here.' This is how it stands. You can have a bed all to yourself for five shillings, but you can't have more than half a share of the room it stands in. Do you see what I mean, young gentleman? Arthur hesitated. The idea of sleeping in the same room with a total stranger did not present an attractive prospect to him. What sort of man is it who has got the other bed? Is he a gentleman? I mean, is he a quiet, well-behaved person? The quietest man I ever came across, as sober as a judge, and as regular as clockwork in his habits. It hasn't struck nine, not ten minutes ago, and he's in his bed already. Is he asleep, do you think? I know he's asleep. Uh, come up and see the room, said the host, leading the way to the staircase. The room was larger and cleaner than Arthur expected. The occupied bed was nearest the window. The curtains were all drawn round it, except the half-curtain at the bottom. Arthur saw the feet of the sleeping man raising the scanty clothes into a sharp little eminence, as if he was lying flat on his back. He took the candle and advanced softly to draw the curtain. "'He is a very quiet sleeper,' said Arthur. "'Yes,' said the landlord. "'Very quiet.' Young Holliday looked in at the man cautiously. "'How pale he is!' Arthur stooped down closer over the stranger, looked at his ashy, parted lips, listened breathlessly for an instant, looked again at the strangely still face and the motionless lips and chest, and turned round suddenly on the landlord. "'Come here!' he whispered. 
Come here, for God's sake. The man's not asleep. He is dead. You have found that out sooner than I thought you would, said the landlord composedly. Yes, he's dead, sure enough. How did he die? Who is he? asked Arthur, staggered for the moment by the audacious coolness of the answer. As to who he is, I know no more about him than you do. My girl brought him up his tea at five, and as he was pouring of it out, he fell down in a faint or a fit. We couldn't bring him to, and the doctor said he was dead. And there he is, and the coroner's inquest's coming up as soon as it can. You don't expect your five shillings back, do you? There's the bed I promised you clean and comfortable. There's the man I warranted not to disturb you. If you're frightened to stop alone with him, that's not my lookout. I've kept my part of the bargain, and I mean to keep the money. You shan't have the five shillings for nothing, my man. I'll keep the bed. Will you? said the landlord. Then I wish you a good night's rest. With that brief farewell, he went out and shut the door after him. A good night's rest. The words had hardly been spoken, the door had hardly been closed before Arthur half repented the hasty words that had just escaped him. He heard a distant church clock strike ten. Only ten. How was he to pass the long night in the same chamber with the dead? All desire to sleep or rest had left him. The bare thought of lying down on the unoccupied bed instantly drew the picture on his mind of a dreadful mimicry of the position of the dead man. Who was he? What was the story of his past life? While these thoughts were passing through his mind, he had stopped insensibly at the window close to which stood the foot of the bed with the closed curtains. At first he looked at it absently, and then a perverse desire took possession of him to do the very thing which he had resolved not to do up to this time, to look at the dead man. He stretched out his hand towards the curtains, but checked himself in the very act of undrawing them, turned his back sharply on the bed and walked towards the chimney-piece to see what things were on it, and to try if he could keep the dead man out of his mind in that way. There was a pewter inkstand with some mildewed remains of ink in the bottle, and there was a square of embossed card, dirty and fly-blown, with a collection of wretched riddles printed on it. He took the card and went away to read it at the table on which the candle was placed, sitting down with his back resolutely turned to the curtained bed. Before he could begin reading, the sound of the church clock stopped him. Eleven. He had got through an hour of the time in the room with the dead man. Once more he looked at the card. It was not easy to make out the letters printed on it in consequence of the dimness of the light, a common tallow candle furnished with a pair of heavy old-fashioned steel snuffers. He took up the snuffers and trimmed the wick. The light brightened directly and the room became less dismal. Again he turned to the riddles. All his efforts, however, could not fix his attention on them. At last he gave up the struggle, threw the card from him impatiently, and took to walking softly up and down the room. The dead man, the dead man, the hidden dead man on the bed. There was the one persistent idea still haunting him, hidden. Was it only the body being there, or was it the body being there concealed that was preying on his mind? He stopped at the window with that doubt in him, listening to the pattering rain. Still the dead man. The darkness forced his mind back upon itself, reviving with a painfully vivid distinctness the momentary impression it had received from his first sight of the corpse. Before long, the face seemed to be hovering out in the middle of the darkness, confronting him through the window, with the features growing larger and larger and moving closer till they seemed to fill the window and to silence the rain and to shut out the night. He reasoned with himself for a little while, and then resolved to shake his mind free of the ghastly counterfeit by forcing himself to confront the solemn reality. Without allowing himself an instant to hesitate, he parted the curtains at the foot of the bed and looked through. There was the sad, peaceful white face, with the awful mystery of stillness on it, laid back upon the pillow. No stir, no change there. 
he returned to walking up and down the room, persevering in it this time till the clock struck again. Twelve. As the sound of the clock bell died away, it was succeeded by the confused noise downstairs of the drinkers in the tap room leaving the house. Then the silence followed again and was disturbed no more. He was alone now, absolutely hopelessly alone with the dead man till the morning. The wick of the candle wanted trimming again. His hand trembled a little and the snuffers were heavy and awkward to use. He closed them a hair's breadth too low. In an instant the candle was out and the room was plunged in pitch darkness. The one impression which the absence of light immediately produced on his mind was distrust of the curtained bed. He had put his carpet bag on the table when he first entered the room, and he now reached out his hand softly, opened the bag and groped in it for his travelling writing case, in which he knew that there was a small store of matches. He lighted the candle again, and on the instant of its burning up, the first object in the room that his eyes sought for was the curtained bed. Just before the light had been put out, he had looked in that direction and had seen no change. "'no disarrangement of any sort in the folds of the closely drawn curtains. "'When he looked at the bed now, he saw, hanging over the side of it, "'a long, white hand. "'It lay perfectly motionless where the curtain at the head and the curtain at the foot met. "'Nothing more was visible. "'The clinging curtains hid everything but the long, white hand.' How he got to the bed, how he wrought himself up to unclose the curtains and look in, he never has remembered. It is enough that he did go to the bed and that he did look inside the curtains. The man had moved. One of his arms was outside the clothes. His face was turned a little on the pillow. His eyelids were wide open. One glance showed Arthur this. One glance before he flew breathlessly to the door and alarmed the house. The porter was the first to appear on the stairs. In three words, Arthur told him what had happened and sent him for the nearest doctor. I, who tell you this story, was then staying with a medical friend in practice at Doncaster, taking care of his patients for him during his absence. And I, for the time being, was the nearest doctor. When the man from the two robins rang the night bell, I did not believe a word of his story about a dead man who had come to life again. However, I armed myself with one or two bottles of restorative medicine and ran to the inn. My surprise at finding that the man had spoken the literal truth was almost, if not quite, equalled by my astonishment at finding myself face to face with Arthur Holliday as soon as I entered the bedroom. We shook hands amazedly, and then I hurried to the man on the bed. There was plenty of hot water in the boiler and plenty of flannel to be had. With these, with my medicines, and with such help as Arthur could render under my direction, I dragged the man literally out of the jaws of death. When he came to, as the phrase goes, he was a startling object to look at, with his colourless face, his sunken cheeks, his wild black eyes and his long black hair. The first question he asked me about himself when he could speak made me suspect that I had been called in to a man in my own profession— he said that he had come from Paris, where he had been attached to a hospital, that he had lately returned to England to continue his studies, had been taken ill on the journey and had stopped to rest and recover himself at Doncaster. He did not add a word about his name or who he was, and of course I did not question him on the subject. All I inquired was what branch of the profession he intended to follow. Any branch, he said bitterly, which will put bread into the mouth of a poor man? At this, Arthur burst out impetuously in his usual good-humoured way. My dear fellow! Everybody was my dear fellow with Arthur. Now you have come to life again. Don't begin by being downhearted about your prospects. I'll answer for it. I can help you to some capital thing in the medical line. Or if I can't, I know my father can. The medical student looked at him steadily. Thank you. May I ask who your father is? He's well enough known all about this part of the country. His name is Holiday. My hand was on the man's wrist during this brief conversation. The instant the name of Holiday was pronounced, I felt the pulse under my fingers flutter, stop, 
go on suddenly with a bound and beat afterwards for a minute or two at a fever rate. How did you come here? asked the stranger quickly, passionately almost. Arthur related briefly what had happened from the time of his first taking the bed at the inn. I am indebted to Mr. Holliday's son, then, for the help that has saved my life, said the medical student, speaking to himself with a singular sarcasm in his voice. Come here. With all my heart, said Arthur, taking his hand cordially. The stranger's wild black eyes were fixed with a look of eager interest on Arthur's face, and his long, bony fingers kept tight hold of Arthur's hand. The two faces were close together. I looked at them, and to my amazement I was suddenly impressed by the sense of a likeness between them, not in features or complexion, but solely in expression. "'You have saved my life,' said the strange man. "'If you had been my own brother, you could not have done more for me than that.' "'I hope I have not done being of service to you yet,' said Arthur." I'll speak to my father as soon as I get home. You seem to be fond and proud of your father, said the medical student. I suppose in return he is fond and proud of you? Of course he is, answered Arthur, laughing. Is there anything wonderful in that? Isn't your father fond of... The stranger suddenly dropped young Holliday's hand and turned his face away. I... "'Beg your pardon,' said Arthur. "'I hope I have not unintentionally pained you. "'I hope you have not lost your father. "'I can't well lose what I have never had. "'You have brought a poor devil back into the world "'who has no business there. "'Do I astonish you? "'I have no name and no father. "'The merciful law of society tells me I am nobody's son.' Ask your father if he will be my father too and help me in life with the family name. Arthur looked at me more puzzled than ever. I said nothing but prepared to write a prescription. Arthur volunteered the loan of a travelling writing case and, bringing it to the bed, shook the notepaper out of the pocket in his usual careless way. With the paper there fell out a small packet of sticking plaster and a little watercolour drawing of a landscape. The medical student took up the drawing and looked at it. His eye fell on some initials neatly written in cipher in one corner. He started and trembled. His pale face grew whiter than ever. His wild black eyes turned on Arthur. A pretty drawing. Ah, and done by such a pretty girl, said Arthur. Oh, such a pretty girl. I wish it was not a landscape. I wish it was a portrait of her. You admire her very much? Love at first sight. But the course of it doesn't run smooth. It's the old story. She is trammelled by a rash engagement to some poor man who is never likely to get money enough to marry her. A momentary distortion passed across the student's face, and I saw one of his hands clutch up the bedclothes and squeeze them hard. He opened his eyes, fixed them once more searchingly on Arthur, and said, slowly and distinctly, you like her, and she likes you. The poor man may die out of your way. Who can tell that she may not give herself as well as her drawing after all? Before young Holliday could answer, he turned to me and said, I beg that Mr. Holliday will not mention to anyone, least of all to his father, the events that have occurred and the words that have passed in this room. I entreat him to bury me in his memory as, but for him, I might have been buried in my grave. Arthur, completely bewildered, gave the required pledge. I took young Holliday away with me immediately afterwards to the house of my friend, determining to go back to see the medical student again before he had left in the morning. I returned to the inn at eight o'clock, purposely abstaining from waking Arthur, I have already alluded to certain reports or scandals which I knew of relating to the early life of Arthur's father. While I was thinking of what had passed at the inn, of the change in the student's pulse when he heard the name of Holiday, of the resemblance of expression that I had discovered between his face and Arthur's, of the emphasis he had laid on those three words, my own brother, and of his incomprehensible acknowledgement of his own illegitimacy, 
something within me whispered, it is best that those two young men should not meet again. So I went alone to the inn the next morning. I had missed my only opportunity of seeing my nameless patient again. He had been gone nearly an hour when I inquired for him. I have now told you everything that I know for certain in relation to the man whom I brought back to life. What I have next to add is matter for inference and surmise. I have to tell you first that the medical student turned out to be strangely and unaccountably right in assuming that Arthur Holliday would marry the young lady who had given him the watercolour drawing. That marriage took place a little more than a year after the events occurred which I have just been relating. The young couple came to live in the neighbourhood in which I was then established in practice. For three years they lived together happily. At the expiration of that time the symptoms of a serious illness first declared themselves in Mrs. Arthur Holliday. It turned out to be a long, lingering, hopeless malady. I attended her throughout. I called one evening as usual and found her alone with a look in her eyes which told me she had been crying. She confessed to me that she had been looking over some old letters which had been addressed to her by a man to whom she had been engaged. He followed my profession and went abroad to study. They had corresponded regularly until the time when, as she believed, he had returned to England. From that period she heard no more of him. I asked when the first estrangement had begun and found that the time exactly corresponded with the time at which I had been called in to my mysterious patient at the Two Robins Inn. A fortnight after the conversation, she died. In the course of time, Arthur married again, and I have seen little or nothing of him. I have some years to pass over before I can approach to anything like a conclusion of this fragmentary narrative. One rainy autumn evening, while I was still practising as a country doctor, I was sitting alone, thinking over a case which sorely perplexed me, when I heard a low knock at the door of my room. "'Come in,' I cried. After a momentary delay, the lock moved, and a long, white, bony hand stole round the door as it opened. The hand was followed by a man whose face instantly struck me with a very strange sensation. There was something familiar to me in the look of him. He quietly introduced himself as Mr. Lorne, presented to me some excellent professional recommendations, and proposed to fill the place then vacant of my assistant. It was on the tip of my tongue to say that I thought I had met with him before, but there was something in his face which unaccountably restrained me from speaking, and which as unaccountably attracted me to him at once, and made me feel ready and glad to accept his proposal. He took the assistant's place on that very day, and we got on together as if we had been old friends from the first, but he never volunteered any confidences on the subject of his past life. I had long had a notion that my patient at the inn might have been a natural son of the elder Mr. Holliday's, and that he might also have been the man who was engaged to Arthur's first wife. And now another idea occurred to me, that Mr. Lorne was the only person in existence who could, if he chose, enlighten me on both those points. But he never did choose, and I was never enlightened. All I know is that in those days of my country practice, when I came home late and found my assistant asleep and woke him, he used to look, in coming to, wonderfully like the stranger as he raised himself in the bed on that memorable night at the Two Robins Inn. The Dead Hand by Wilkie Collins was adapted by Michael Bakewell. It was read by Peter Marinka and produced by Rosemary Hart.